Anyway, it's great to see so, so many uh, familiar faces here tonight. I do feel like a little bit of a broad standing up here talking to you about Connick, bearing in mind that three of our vets, namely Chloe, uh, Zoe and Charla, are all doing certificates in internal medicine and probably know a lot more about this subject than I do. And furthermore, sadly, I already feel as I've reached a stage in my career where there's more information leaving my brain than it is staying in. But even so, I'll give it as good a go as I possibly can. When Ben asked me to talk about colic, I thought rather than just go through all the different types of colic that can occur, it might be more interesting to really look at the risk factors and maybe what we can do to help prevent those risk factors from occurring. Um, there are, it has proved to be actually quite a challenge, um, bear in mind that despite colic being such a common problem, there isn't a huge amount of uh, scientific data out there with which to give you detailed information. And furthermore, what's, what information that is out there is now a little bit outdated, and some of the studies as well are based on uh, American studies rather than UK. So I think the first thing to do is, is to basically say, well, what's the significance of colic? Um, well, it's hugely significant. If you look at some figures from our practice that Ben got out for me, from our system, over the last 12 months, We've attended 337 colic cases, which is near enough one a day. I would say that that's probably a gross underestimate of the number of colic cases that are occurring within the population of horses in our practice, bearing in mind that as owners, I'm sure that you are able to manage the milder cases yourselves, for which we're never made aware of. So, you know, that in itself suggests it's of a, a, a major significance. Um, if you look at various surveys amongst owners as well, um, it has shown to be the, in the top three conditions that cause owners concern with respect to the health of their horse. And lastly, there's known recurrence risk with colic as well. That basically means that once a horse has had an episode of colic, uh, it's been proven that it's had an increased risk to have further episodes potentially. And as we all know, sadly, there's also a mortality risk associated with colic as well. What we've done as well is taken some data out of our practice and looked at the top five conditions that we're asked to attend on call-outs. And the top one that comes up is lameness at 43%, but colic then comes in at second at 19%. What I was hoping to be able to do is actually um, to work out what percentage of the colic call-outs are out of ours, because it appears to me, and I don't know if Jonathan and Ben are would back me up on this, but a good 60 to 70 percent of our out of hour calls are probably colleagues. Um, at weekends. Yeah. At weekends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and to social times. Right, now this relies on me being able to operate a computer, which is always a worry. Um, what I thought I'd do quickly is just talk you through some anatomy. Then, <laughs> Or Thurston. <laughs> Sometimes I should be asking for Thurston, actually. <laughs> just need you to. You'll be able to quite um, <laughs> <laughs> This is basically, uh, I think this is a glass horse demonstration. Um, so it's worth just having a look at it as I walk through a bit of anatomy with you. Um, horses are basically hind gut fermented. So what basically that means is that they have bacteria in their large colon and cecum, which produce acid <coughs> that helps to digest feedstuff. The actual gastrointestinal tract itself is about 100 foot long um, and is made up of about 48 gallons worth of water and ingested, so it's a, a, a vastly huge organ. Um, it starts off um, at the stomach and from there it will pass through into the small intestine and then into the cecum um, and then from the cecum into the large bowel, which we can see, I've got a pointer right here, yes, that's there, sorry, large colon there. And then from the large colon, it ends in this bit here, namely the small colon. So colic itself can be uh, a manifestation of any problem in that area of the gastrointestinal tract. And the sort of things that we see are things like obstructions, which would be something like an impaction, um, strangulation, where the gut effectively twists, twists around on itself, or a displacement. And sometimes you can have colic related to loss of motility. So there's various different reasons why we have horses experience colic pain. Um, 
This slide here, if we do the pelvic flexion one first, is, is, is an example of a horse that has an impaction. So what we're looking at here is over a period of time, the large colon at the bottom here will start to build up with ingester and push its way back towards the pelvic inlet. Alongside that, because of the obstruction of all the food material and fecal material within the large colon, it will cause a build-up of gas as well, which is what we're going to see in a minute, I think. Uh, every time you press the button, it stops pauses. Try it again. <laughs> <laughs> I never let you bend down. Could be a long night. Yeah. Here we go. So I'll try and talk you through it. So now you see where that large colon is. Effectively what will happen is the ingester will start to build up there as a big doughy mass, and as a consequence, it will obstruct gas further forward to that and cause the uh, large colon to expand and push its way back towards the pelvic inlet. So that's the classic pelvic flexure impaction, which we see in awful lot of The diagram on the right will show a horse that has a displacement, and at that, let me just show you the point quickly where to look for. This is where the colon, the large bowel, instead of sitting on the bottom of the horse's belly, will start to migrate up the side, the left side of the abdominal wall and hook itself over the top of the spleen next to the left kidney. And that's an example of a displacement colic. Let's just show this show thing there. Here we go, off it goes. Okay, it's creeping all the way up. And this is usually due to a build-up of gas within the colon. Horses guts aren't the best of designs. Um, there's a lot of ability for them to move around and, and, and do things they shouldn't do. So moving on, next Ben. Um, incidence of colic. <laughs> Various studies have been done on this. Um, there is a suggested incidence of colic of 3 to 10 cases for every horse in a year. So basically what that means is that if you pick a population of 100 horses and watch them for a year, you should potentially expect to see 3 to 10 cases of colics amongst those horses. However, other studies have suggested that there is a big population variation amongst so in other words, as the figures say there, there can be up to 6 to 30 cases per 100 horses per year. And what that basically means is that there are different risk factors associated to different populations of horses, such that some horses in a given population may be more at risk of getting colic than others. <coughs> Why these figures are important is that if we know roughly what to expect as far as an instance of colic is concerned, we can then determine whether a given population of horses is at an increased incidence. And if that is the case, the first thing that we would need to be able to potentially do is identify what those risk factors are and then see if we can prevent them from occurring. And by doing that, hopefully then we would reduce or drop the incidence of colic from doing that. This slide here shows or lists all the possible risk factors associated with colic in horses, and some are certainly more important than others, and some are out of our control, whereas, whereas others definitely are within our control. So if we start off with age, um, again, there's variable data as far as whether the actual age of a horse will influence its increased likelihood to have a colic. A study by Tinker and Tool, uh, Tinker and Tool um, an American study, which was based on uh, 31 uh, American stud farms, looked at these horses and found that horses in between the age of 2 and 10 years of age were actually at an increased risk. Now again, I don't necessarily think the conclusions to that study were that it was actually their age that was the issue, but it was more what these horses went on to do in the way of work, and that these horses were more common age for competition type horses. What we do know, though, is that the types of colic potentially can be age-related. So, for instance, I've used grasses as an example in younger horses. Um, it is a, 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 a colic which occurs at horses more or less permanently at pasture in the spring and causes paralysis of their guts, but that is much more common in younger horses. Whereas in this cartoon here, um, older horses are potentially more at risk of getting a pedunculated lipoma, which is a little fatty tumour, which is that that forms on a stalk and then can wrap itself round a portion of gut and strangulate the gut. Um, Chris Proudman is a guy who does a lot of work as far as colic is concerned. And his study in 1991 um, basically looked at 200 colic cases over a two-year period in first opinion practice. And to give you an idea about the incidence of surgical colic, he found that amongst those 200 of her horses, that there was a 7% incidence of, of surgical colics. 
And of those, 64% were older than 15 years of age. So although I don't say necessarily you can say age specifically increases the risk, what I do think you can say is that the older horses are at more risk of having a surgical colic. And clearly when we're looking at horses in the field, it does influence what decision-making process you go through as far as treatments are concerned. Moving on to breed, well I struggled with this one to be honest with you, again based on American studies, and I hope the numbers for Arabs and Perbreds and the that, but they seem to think there was potentially an increased risk amongst those breeds, but I think that was pretty controversial in what they were trying to suggest from that, and certainly the significance of that in this country is probably highly debatable. One thing that doesn't seem to make a difference is gender, so no man flu type issues as far as the is concerned. <laughs> right, owner care. Uh, I was a little bit worried about putting this slide in, because there may be people here who run livery yards. But having said that, again, based on studies, um, it has been shown that horses that are specifically looked after by their owner alone have a reduced risk of colic. So there may be a number of different reasons for that actually occurring. I suppose the most obvious one is that perhaps it's your own horse, your dedication towards its care is perhaps going to be that little bit higher, and perhaps the amount of time you've got to look after that horse will be that much more. But often, if you look at the livery yard uh, scenario, Mark Hillier did a study that looked at the, the fact there was an increased risk of colic in larger premises, so more horses, more risk of colic. So it may well be more the fact that individual owners may have their horses in small holdings or just one or two horses, whereas on big livery yards, more horses, less access to pasture, perhaps increased exposure to worms, all those sort of things will push up perhaps the incidence of colic. So again, a lot of that is a little bit beyond your control in certain situations. Next one is, 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 is type of work, and this follows on again with Mark Hillier's study. Um, he found an increased incidence of um, colic in UK uh, thoroughbred racehorses in training. And similar studies have shown the same to occur in eventing and show horses as well. And again, I don't consider it's really the um, exercise or the type of work that they're doing that's the issue. It's the fact that we have to adjust their management to enable them to compete at that level. And it's those adjustments in their management, i.e. the stable management, the diet, the transport and stress of trainers, this is on this slide, that basically <coughs> take the horse out of it, what would be its normal natural environment, and put it under extra stress. So that's probably the reason why we see more cases of colic in that particular population of horses. So moving on to season and climate, again, like a lot of this you'll start to realise, the study suggests a lot of conflicting data occurs. <coughs> um, back to Chris Proudman's study, he found that there was absolutely no correlation to be between weather and whether a horse is likely to get a or not. However, there is definitely a seasonal change in the way that you manage your horses that potentially would put them at an increased risk. So the classic scenario is horses in the winter having to come back out, you know, limited access to turnout, standing in the stable, getting large colon or, or impactions as we showed in that previous diagram. So definite seasonal changes, and the next slide will show this quite nicely. Um, and then going back to types of colic as well, um, there are certain <coughs> types of colic that are more seasonal. So using my grass sickness case as an example, that's almost exclusively something that we see in the spring. Um, and again, using the impaction scenario, more commonly we perhaps see that in the winter in stable horses. So types of colic potentially seasonal as well. Looking at some figures from our practice again, um, this is again 12 months worth of uh, colic cases from February of last year to February this year. And each month we can see that there's an increased number of cases over the winter months. So it really starts more or less, say, from September to October, and it spikes up at certainly February, March. And again, that has to be potentially down to the fact that these horses probably aren't being exercised as much, they will more or less access to pasture. All those things combined push up the risk of the horse developing colic. Another big factor is stereotypical behaviour. And the two most common uh, vices that we see that would increase a horse's likelihood to have colic are cribbing and wind sucking. This diagram here shows a horse that's cribbing and basically as you probably all well know is when a horse grasps a solid object and then draws in air to its stomach. 
windsurfers are particularly clever horses. They don't need to necessarily even hold on to anything. They can do it just literally without the aid of any solid objects. Lots of studies have looked into this. The actual reason why horses develop these vices is still not fully understood. Again, if we keep harping on about management, it's put down to the fact that they uh, spend more time in the stable, boredom, stress, all that sort of thing. And even potentially in young horses, a, a learned component of behaviour has been suggested as well. But looking at the figures from the Escalona study, um, they suggested that uh, a third of these horses will get colic, of which half of their population in their study okay. required veterinary attention as well. Okay. Moving on to the study by Malamed, I found this a little confusing, if I'm being honest, because his conclusion was that anxious horses, I don't know how you determine whether a horse is anxious, stressed, or whatever it is, because definitely stressed horses are potentially at an increased risk of colic. But he suggests anxious horses were not at an increased risk. However, if we go back to horses that are in the stable and are stressed or, or are stressed by their training methods, then they, we know for a fact through gastroscopy now that these horses are prone to gastric ulcers, particularly in what we call the pyloric area of the stomach, which is a large portion of the stomach. So, I don't know, I think um, certainly the biases make sense. Manomed study about anxiety horses, different ones to equate, but the stress factor is definitely there as far as ulcers are concerned. And, and maybe some of you have horses that have had that problem. <laughs> so what can we do to help protect, um, prevent these stereotypical issues from occurring? Well, really, again, it's down to management. Um, trying to maintain them on a high uh, fibre diet with a reduction in the concentrates in their diet as well. Plentiful access to pasture helps to be able to provide the fibre as well, as well as giving them a more natural environment, reducing their stress levels. There are various antacids on the market as well. Um, again, limited scientific data to prove necessarily how work, well they work. There is one, oh, I remember I said it, it's Nalox. I don't even know if you can still get it, because I've been suggesting this to guys, and no one seems to be able to find it now. It's an American um, product, um, and I got put in touch with that by a vet called Dickie Hepburn, who does a lot of work in gastric ulceration, so um, he suggests that's maybe something to look at. Interestingly, a study by... Um, Scantlebury, not, you know, last year looked at horses that had these vices and found that by adding fruit and vegetables, it didn't mention which ones, but by adding them to their diet, it helped to reduce the frequency of colic in horses that had these vice-related products. And lastly, I don't know if you've seen them, but you can get these collars that fit around their throats that help. They look a bit mean, but they have potentially help as well to stop, stop them from getting these types of products. So the big one is diet. Without a doubt, this is the number one factor as far as risk of colic is concerned. And I think all authors on various studies will agree on that one thing. I, didn't re I knew Claire was coming today, Claire from Denji this is, and thank God that the handout that she's done you more or less matches what I put on these slides. <laughs> and furthermore, hers is a lot more detailed and a lot more informative than mine, so make sure you have a good read of that, because that is um, it's, it's some good stuff on there. Um, and you did look at the same study as this one, didn't you? The, the Tinker study, yeah. Um, he, he, they looked at a lot of this sort of stuff. Um, and, and you've got to bear in mind that horses are effectively, um, you know, they're, they're constant grazers, really. They're, they're designed to be moving around in a, in a pasture, looking for their food. And it's all of these things, dietary related, that you, when you remove them from the village to do that, that cause the problems. So the first thing he did was he looked at horses that were on the highest level of concentrate. And what he found with them was that they were at six times increased risk of developing colic compared to other horses that were either on a high fibre diet or out at pasture more or less permanently. He also found that feeding frequency didn't actually make a big difference. So often, and I still think it's probably not a bad idea to do it, but often feeding small feeds frequently, he found that if you feed them more than three times a day, that didn't influence whether or not they got an increased risk of colic compared to the other horses. Well, without a doubt, the constituents of the, the constituents of the feed are very important as well. The more processed the feed, particularly pellet-like feeds, um, he found that there would be a, a, an increased risk of, of colic with those. And forage as well, as we know, <coughs> if you boost the fibre content in the diet, you're hopefully going to see a, a, a reduced risk in, in colic compared to feeding them on the high concentrate diet. But it's important that forage, I think that's a, it says it in Claire's that she is a good quality as well. It's no good providing them with hay, thinking, oh great, we're giving them plenty of good fibre here, but then the hay's rubbish, because it's non-digestible, so you're not going to be much further forward. 
And the important thing as well is he knows that if you change your feed more than the expected perhaps once or twice a year, you again increase the risk of, of developing colic in your horse. So again, dietary management, read Claire's hand out, but some of the things that you can potentially think of doing is firstly reducing the concentrate levels in the diet, uh, the carbohydrates, soluble carbohydrates, um, and increasing the amount of fibre. And as a rough guide, you'd be wanting to feed about 1-2% to of its body weight in fibre, and that must be at least 50% of the overall diet. If you do have competition horses and you need to up the energy content in their feed, then you can add fat, and I hope I'm not talking out of terms, I'm not a nutritionist, but you can add fat and various other things to help boost their energy calorie requirements without having to rely upon upping the carbohydrate levels. The other thing you ideally want to try and do is, again, mimic their natural feeding habits. So turnout's obviously fantastic, um, or plentiful access to good quality hay. Um, and, and try as best you can to ensure that you feed the horse at the same time every day. They're creatures of habit, and that's how they like it to be done. If you do need to change their diet, and again, this probably moves on to sort of when you change on from an old batch of hay to a new, ideally you would want to do that over a one to two week period of time and mix the old hay in with the new hay so there isn't that sudden change from one type of hay to another. And I put this in here because I have a couple of farmer friends who've tried this in the past. Try and make sure that you feed your horse horse feed. There are t some people I've known who thought there was a bit of cattle food there. That might do. And it uh, didn't work very well. So if you think you're saving any money on either feed that's not for horses or food that's spoiled, you'll find you'll spend more on vet feeds than you will on anything you're saving on feed. And then the last thing is um, access to water. It's really important that you make sure that your horse has plentiful access to water and a good, you know, clean, non-contaminated and over the winter, that's something to look out for. Again, going back to the impaction colics, frozen water buckets or your automatic drink, drinkers freezing up and, and therefore the horse isn't taking the same level of water down and becomes slightly dehydrated and that affects the gut motility and everything else leading to impaction. So we already covered a lot of this, access to pasture without doubt. That's where horses should be, like in that picture there, running around in a paddock, doing what they're designed to do. So if we can allow them to do that, then hopefully we would expect a reduced um, risk of um, colic occurring. And I think it's Scamperbury's um, study showed that there is a decreased risk of recurrent colic in horses that are kept on pasture. There are some risk factors, and the first thing is that ideally you need to keep your stocking density to less than, say, one to one and a half horses per acre. More horses, obviously, than that, and you get problems. The other thing is, is pasture quality. I, I, unfortunately, we're not all in that privileged situation have beautiful paddocks. Um, but again, there has been studies shown that when the paddock is of a poor quality, there is an increased risk. And I suppose one example of colics we see in that respect might be the sand impactions we see when we get these sparse areas of grass, uh, dry period followed by a little bit of rain, sandy soil, and the horse, when it grazes, pulls up not only the grass, but also pulls the roots and the, and the sand with it. So there are certain areas in the, in, in our, in the, in, in the practice we do where they've got increased risk of sand impaction. Clearly, if you've got a lot of horses grazing in a limited area, you're going to potentially have an increased uh, exposure to worms. And like moving to a new paddock and changing your grazing times is effectively the same as a change in diet. So if you're going to do that, try and introduce it gradually or restrict their amount of grazing time and increase it over a period of time rather than all of a sudden. So moving on, the complete opposite really is stabling. That's not where horses are expected to be. Um, and again, studies so show that the risk is directly proportional to the number of hours that they're actually in the stable. Um, the greatest risk being in horses that spend their entire time in the stable. I think bedding is a key component to this as well. Um, we see probably more colics on horses, uh, in horses that are particularly on a straw bed, maybe hemp as well, compared to shavings or paper. And again, I think that's the fact that the horse is standing in more, getting a little bit bored, maybe eating up what food you've already offered it, and then starts to nibble on its bed, and then we go back to the pelvic flexure impaction again. So <laughs> if you've got a worry in that respect, then clearly bedding is of an influence. And we talked a bit about stress and ulceration in the stomach. Again, horses in the stable potentially are at more risk of developing gastric ulceration than those out in the paddock. So looking at ways we can reduce those risks, 
Um, exercise is number one. There are plenty of horses that need to stay in the stable 24 hours a day, but if they get regular exercise, that makes a massive difference to their levels of risk. And even if they can't be exercised, maybe you can turn them out in little playpen pad or mud paddocks or something just to get them out of the stable for a period of time. Even doing things like hand grazing will help. So you can take them out sort of a couple of times a day and graze them in hand on a bit of grass you can find on the verge of the road or somewhere like that. That will help. And as we've already mentioned, choose a bedding which is the horse is not likely to want to eat. And then back to water again. Try and ensure that there's a plentiful supply of water at all times. Right, so exercise, and all this just is a bit logical, maybe I am repeating myself a bit, but it follows on from one thing to the next. Um, human studies have looked into this, which is why I've got Mo Farah and Jim Royal here. There's an absolute direct relationship between um, the amount of exercise you do and your intestinal motility. So if we go back to the impaction scenario yet again, um, these horses are in the stable, they're not doing any exercise, and as a consequence, <coughs> they effectively can have reduced gut motility, which would lead to that problem. The classic scenario here is a horse, particularly, like we go back to the racehorses that do a tendon injury, so these horses are in intense training, exercise every day, bang, they do their tendon, and the vet says, right, you're in the box, and that's it. The risk period is usually about a week after the injury occurring for pelvic flexure impactions, and it's a scenario where it's multifactorial, obviously you've got your reduction in exercise, onto a, potentially onto a straw bed, um, and loss of exercise, ability to do um, exercise. So you always want to forward think this. If you've got a horse that's got a lameness problem and perhaps your vet says, right, you need to box rest it, you need to think to yourself, okay, well, how can I help reduce the chances of it getting colic? First thing is to put it on a sloppy or laxative type diet. So soaking your hay net, um, make, even making the short feed a bit sloppy for the first few days will help. Bedding, try and use a shavings bed, avoid straw. Uh, again, plentiful access to water. And if you can, reduce its stress levels. If you've got other horses that you can babysit and, and try and keep it calm, that will help as well. I thought I'd put this one in because it's actually quite interesting. I went to, uh, in Newmarket in January, a stud course, and they were talking about these stut um, shuttle stallions that effectively travel, they do a breeding season in Newmarket and then fly out to Australia and do another breeding season over there. And these horses are, are understandably put under a lot of stress as far as transport is concerned, moving that distance. And as a consequence of that, they talked about all of the preventive measures that are put in place to reduce the likelihood of colic occurring, amongst many other things as well. And that starts really even before the horse ever steps on the plane, but certainly occurs during the journey and even after the, the, the horse arriving in its new destination. So without a doubt, the longer the journey is, the more chances the horse would develop a potential colic. And they've looked at sort of being more than three hours or 500 miles as a sort of figure to look at. I certainly think that from a road transport point of view, ideally, you know, these horses should not travel for more than 12 hours a day by road. And if they have to, you know, if they, if they are doing that level of uh, journey, they need to have regular rests in between. And at night, if you're doing sort of stage journeys, they need to have good eight hours of proper stable to allow them to recover in between. Common sense stuff really, making sure particularly in the summer that they get plenty of stocks of some water, soap pay nets again, trying to keep their diet soft, keep them hydrated. Um, and even things like teaching your horse how to load and unload and getting it used to travelling if you're going to anticipate doing a lot of driving around your horse. Because again, that will help reduce any uh, stress levels. We're nearly there now. The dental problems, again, Mark Ilya's study looked into this and he found that there was an, an increased risk of colic in horses that have dental problems, and probably would see this more in the older horses where there's likely to be that more wear and tear as far as our uh, teeth are concerned. And one of the factors that may be associated with this is that horses that have dental problems clearly will not be able to chew their food so efficiently, and as a consequence, um, they will swallow food of a higher fibre length. And that is less digestible and potentially can then lead on to problems. So what can we do to help that? Well, again, we do a lot of dental work now, and particularly in old horses, and I think one thing that's changed, and Jonathan probably back me up on this over the last 10 years, is the standard of dentistry has massively improved. So even in older horses where there is significant abnormal wear, there's a number of different things we can now do to help them out. But probably just as importantly, if not more, is the diet that you feed them, and again, Claire probably knows more on this, on this than I do, but 
Again, it's trying to up the fibre levels in their diet. You can get these high fibre cubes now, which you can soak and almost make them into a gruel. Um, you can add some mixes and some sugar beet to add some other stuff that they require. And even if you need to make it more palatable, you can add some chopped uh, carrot and bits of apple and, and make it into a soup so the horse therefore doesn't have to rely on them to chew or grind its food any more than it needs to. And again, going back to turn up, what's the best thing for old horses to eat is grass. So that's what you're aiming to do. Last thing to talk about is worms or, or um, endoparasites. Again, a massive association of colic and worms, which is why it's so important that you have efficient uh, worming strategy on your yard or on your or, or at home. Um, looking at the different sort of worms that we see in age groups of horses, uh, the young horses potentially are more at risk of having problems with ascarids, which is the round worm. They can build up in quite large numbers inside the small intestine, which can cause an obstruction. Um, they can also be uh, at increased risk of um, small red worms, so atherstones, which tend to migrate into the gut wall over the winter, and then when the weather improves over the spring, you can get mass emergence of these larvae, which cause a lot of inflammation in the bowel, and um, cause quite profuse diarrhea, weight loss, colic issues. And then the old horses perhaps you see a little bit more of tape work, but I'm not sure that probably that doesn't follow through all age groups, really. Historically, Worms were the big issue as far as colic was concerned until we had efficient worming strategies and better wormers and better uh, ways of controlling it. And these large red worms would migrate, their life cycle would involve migrating through the blood vessels that supply the gut and, and cause damage to blood supply and the consequent um, colic as a, as a consequence. Looking at the studies on this, um, Mark Hillier's study did show that there is an increased risk potentially of a horse developing colic after having had a wormer. However, that's no excuse really not to worm your horse. If you think to yourself, well, I don't want to worm it because I might give it colic. Well, that's the lesser potential of the two evils, really. I just think you need to be aware of it, particularly in a horse, a young horse, if you've bought a horse with no known worming, worming history and you give it a worm, you just need to be a little bit I get, when we're talking about out of hours and colic, try and give it the worm in the morning, so if it gets a colic, it's not in the afternoon. So, those sort of things. So you might expect to see a bit of the horse feeling a bit uncomfortable, maybe off its food for a few days, maybe it's dropping to a change in consistency a bit. Um, the other study by Lenninger uh, showed that, without doubt, and this is probably the more important take, take home message, horses that are on an efficient worming strategy were at reduced risk of getting colic. So that's definitely um, various control measures, as I'm sure you're all well aware. We've already talked about stocking density, so less horses in a given area, less likely to pick up worms. Um, poo pick in your paddocks, you might not have the luxury of one of those wonderful devices, but even so, something I even do in my home. Um, if you've got access to capital sheep on farms and things, they're great at hoovering up worms that affect horses and it won't have any effect on them, so that will help. And then we go back to worming as well. Um, for which there's various ways that you can do that. There's the interval worming during the grazing period where you worm with a given wormer throughout that period of the year based on the time, uh, duration of effect of the wormer. Or strategic worming is more based on results on worm egg counts. Two, the two worms that you must always treat for are tapeworms and cyclostones. So tapeworms you tend to do either in the autumn or the spring. Um, this one here, Equimax, deals with that. And then um, cyathus stones we tend to do, sort of, well, I tend to advise sort of December time, and um, either uh, a quest or uh, a pantry of five dead guard is usually pretty good for that. All year 